The House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. We have um, a great guest. I don't want to leave him waiting. He's on the line and... Uh, He's uh, uh, done uh, another book, and this one is the part two and three, My Final Words, and it's Trapped with Miss Arius. Kirk Nermy, thank you for talking to us today. Nice to be here with you guys. So, uh, Kirk, now where, where are you? Are you stuck somewhere, too, or are you out traveling around? Well, uh, I am home. Um, I made my last trip before this kind of kicked into place, and being in Arizona, I'm also uh, on lockdown, so I've been uh, working out of my house, uh, writing some fiction, and uh, talking with great people like you about the new book. Well, that's nice of you to say. I'm not that great, but... <laughs> <laughs> now, well, so you finally did this part two, three. You did it in one book rather than two. Um, I wasn't sure you were actually going to ever do this book, um, but... It didn't seem to me like you were really that keen on it when I was when I saw you last. So that was quite a while ago. Um, what what made you go through with it? Well, there was a lot of uh, you know personal growth and, and issues going on, maybe behind the scenes. You know, um, just to refresh people's memory, or maybe people don't aren't aware of this, is that when I wrote part one, I was going through chemotherapy. Right. And, uh, you know, I published that and defended that book and, you know, had some issues with the bar and asked for voluntary disbarment. So I was no longer a member of the bar. And as I was kind of living my life, I was really trying to kind of, for lack of a better way of putting it, run away from the Jody Arias experience, that connection, right, that I had, trying to redefine myself, that sort of thing. And I realized... You know, through those years, that it was something that I wasn't going to be able to run away from. And, you know, added to the mix was the fact that, you know, Miss Arias had filed uh, a bar complaint against me that contained um, fictitious materials, fictitious assertions, and she made similar fictitious assertions in a lawsuit against me. And... So eventually I got to the point where I realized I can't run away from this, you know, and I had developed a, a you know, Al, you know, I did a one-man show up in Seattle a couple of years ago right. and kind of retweaked that and reworked that and started a, a, a new one-man show called Overcoming Jody Arias. It was set to debut in April in Arizona that, that got wiped, wiped out with the COVID and it's been delayed. And, but, you know, I, rambling a bit here, but... Um, all those things made me realize that, you know, and, and her appellate decision came down. I realized, you know what, it's time to publish. I'd done some writing. I'd done some writing on it years ago, and I'd done some writing on it more recently. And thought, you know what, her appeal was denied. She's continued to lie about me, uh, continuing her pattern to go after men that she believes have wronged her. So I just simply decided to tell the rest of my story and kind of embrace that part of my life in a, in a different way. Right. Well, you kind of, I think you have to, uh, you probably have to complete it in order to move on completely, right? I think so. I mean, you, you know, Al, you're a writer, and, I, you know, it can be certainly writing certain books can be therapeutic, and I think uh, for me this was therapeutic to get my story out there. You know, you remember... You know, back in 2013, uh, my name was Mud, and it stayed that way until, you know, and maybe is that way in a lot of people's minds based on some misunderstandings. So, um, you know, that was part of my motivation for writing the book, to impose truth upon her lies and her creation of those, uh, many of those misunderstandings anyway. So, yeah, there was certainly a therapeutic element to, instead of running away, stepping back, connecting to it, and... Um, sharing my truth with the world, no doubt about it. So, you know, when you look back and you look at the justice system, um, and even now, um, I, I see so many cases happen, 
um, you know, from making a murder or to this mysterious thing to the, there's just so many cases that kind of hit the news and they become the popular item. Then all of a sudden, um, people start to come up with their judgments. It seems to be so, um, you know, like like you like you said, you were you were slammed. People were really mean and rude, and um, you look at that, that happens in all these cases. People seem to pick out who's the good one and who's the bad one, and and they have all these opinions and stuff. But yet they're not part of the case. They're not part of the the full experience. They're just watching it on the TV or the internet, and then they they can easily make their comments. Um, do you, do you have a different opinion of how the justice system should portray itself and what they should allow on TV? Well, you know, I do have concerns about the idea of, you know, cameras in the courtroom and what that means because as your question kind of highlights the is this idea that when we have cameras in the courtroom and now we have live streaming and we have social media and we have a chance to just kind of uh, you know it's like mentos and seven up right you just put it in there and shake it up and it's ready to explode and you know then that breeds that you know i i use the analogy reality show tv but you know a sporting event is a perfect analogy too because i remember when, you know, Arius was being sentenced and towards the end of the trial, people were dressing up in costumes and had signs like, you know, they would be going to a sporting event. So it is concerning that the pristine nature, and maybe that's too strong a word, but, you know, trial should be sacrosanct in this country as I see it. And I do have strong concerns about the presence of cameras and what that means to justice, not only to justice, but to everybody that is involved in there because, you know, is justice restrained really justice if people are working out of a, with a sense of fear behind them? Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm sort of, uh, I'm not really into, I don't think they should have um, access or they certainly shouldn't show it live. They, sh they maybe show it after the case is all done. Um, it just it has too much of an effect, I think, on people. But that's my opinion. So well, and it's too it's too enticing for someone like her, you know, who's wants attention and wants to manipulate people and things. Can you, can you imagine if Charles Manson's trial was shown on television? What it would have been like to watch him playing for the cameras the way she did? Yeah. Yeah, you know, and I and I always use the analogy like, uh, you know, I, I spoke at CrimeCon several years ago, and my postulation to the crowd where I spoke to was, what if OJ had an iPhone in the back of the Bronco and yeah. could tweet, or yeah. could, you know, the whole dynamic would change. So, to me, though, I mean, yeah, you're right. There's people could um, seek publicity for these things. People could garner attention, do interviews, that sort of thing. But there's also that aspect that social media makes it just all the more enticing for people. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, they become all the more all the more popular, and it becomes all the more of a cultural sensation. Now, do I think people are, you know, committing murders for that reason? No, but I think there are people like we saw, and I can't. Uh, his name's going to escape me now. The Gentlemen and call it one. Well, gentlemen's a strong word, but Chris um, Al might be able to remember his name. The guy who killed his kids in Colorado, Chris Watts. He was doing an interview. Watts, Watts. Yeah, he was. He was doing interviews before he was arrested, right? And so mm -hmm. we do see this um, phenomenon that that is associated with cameras in the courtroom. That because it because it is entertainment to some, and is an avenue for. Um, fame to some as well. Yeah, it's a deadly combination when you have that kind of media attention with a narcissist who's willing to do anything. Yeah, it'll be the TikTok killer next. <laughs> <laughs> so no, no. So Kurt, are you not? Um, so would you ever go back into the legal profession or business, or are you sort of done with it now? Well, in terms of actually practicing law, I'm done. 
Um, when I wrote the first book and had the issues with the bar, they wanted to suspend me for four years, which is a term that would have expired, you know, this fall. But I made the choice. I said, no, I don't want to practice law anymore because I want to move my life in a different direction. I made a promise to myself when I went through chemotherapy, when I was enduring that, that I wasn't going to live my future days the way I had my previous days. And sticking to that promise to me meant cutting ties with the practice of law. Because if I fought the bar, because I think I was ethically justified in saying everything I said in part one of the book, if I fought the bar and won, then I would have an out. Then I wouldn't have to rebuild that life, right? I could just, you know, dink around for a few years. But I really wanted a new life and a new direction. And, and in that regard, one of the things I did, a year or so back as I took the license to practice law that I had, this little thing, uh, the certificate they give you, all gold embossed, and took it out of the frame and set it ablaze in order to kind of get rid of my old life and uh, give rise to the new life. And so my legal work, if you will, is, is you know, limited to commentary. Uh, you can, you know, I'm on Court TV, Law and Crime Network, different places like that offering my opinion on, on different cases, but um, that's that's as far as I'm interested in going. How is it for you now? How is it for you lately? Um, um, when you make these public appearances and shows and stuff like that, when you're in the legal side, like CrimeCon and things like that, how do you find people uh, to be with you? Are they still angry or are they still kind of mean to you or is it kind of toned down? I think it's toned down. There's still some that, you know, function under the misperception that, you know, I was Jody's attorney for fame or for money or for all kinds of things or that I believed her story, which is, I always think I must have great acting ability if people believe that, right? <laughs> but, you know, that, yeah, if, if Quentin Tarantino is listening, please give me a call. Yeah. But, um, you know, um, all those misperceptions are still out there because, you know, Al, no matter where I go and, and speak and, you know, no matter how many shows I do, the amount of eyeballs and ears cast upon will, will never be as great as was the case when people were making that association with me as her attorney. But it's tempered down. People are starting to understand, you know, I did that um, oxygen show in defense of where we talked about the case and, and and hopefully, you know, between the two books on the issue and hopefully when the world opens up, you know, performances are overcoming Jody Arias, they're going to get to see a different side of me, a more um, realistic side of me than what they saw in the courtroom. Well, that brings up an interesting point, if you don't mind me jumping in here, about the social media aspect of that, because I remember when the case was going on, and even afterwards, years afterwards, if you stumbled across anybody on a Facebook true crime page talking about this case, it'd always be a handful of people who were convinced that she was innocent, that it was, you know, that that uh, Travis had been killed by like what was it, ninja assassins or whatever. <laughs> And then, it, you know, they'd have some other theory, and then after the facts kept coming out, eventually it boiled down to, well, she may have done it, but he deserved it, which was just an outrageously ridiculous excuse. Have you encountered any of those kinds of people, or have you had any problems with them? Um, not directly. Um, you know, and I know exactly what you're talking about. I actually refer to them in my book says the cult of Jody, right? There are people that are so delusional that they believe whatever she's saying, they send her money, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, yeah, I get these things online. You know, I think the wackiest one I heard of was that somebody had posited the idea that Mr. Alexander was still alive and was living in the witness protection program. <laughs> and then Jody was taking the fall for this, right? And something I certainly wish was true, but the, that he was still alive, but um, certainly not the case. But I haven't seen any of these people uh, in, their, in their natural habitat, so to speak, out in the world. And uh, quite frankly, I, I, I hope I, I never do. But um, look, it's, 
you know, it, it takes an interesting person. And look, I mean, she does a good job of reeling those people in and convincing them. I mean, look, I, and I haven't checked, but uh, my understanding through some of the appearances I've had and people that follow these things closely is that she's still selling art on online, you know. Probably, so yeah. um, she's still, you know, and, and of course, you know, look, um, this isn't unique completely to, you know, Miss Arias. We see, you know, Ted Bundy got married during the middle of a sentencing hearing on a capital, you know, in his death yeah. penalty case. And, <laughs> and you know, Charles, wasn't Charles Manson married too, I think. But, you know, so we see this all the time, and there are these people that, um, you know, want to be part of something that they conceive is bigger than themselves, and that, you know, that's one of the downsides of of the the publicity that surrounds some of these cases. Well, and also, you know, I can understand some people who maybe have an emptiness in their life and are trying to fill it with some association to a, a case like this. But to pick somebody like Jody Arias, who's in my opinion, it's, she's obviously guilty. I don't know how any rational person could wrap their head around the idea that she's somehow innocent. Um, you know, like when you were saying that she said lies about you and things like that, it's like, I guess some people are shocked that Jody Arias would lie. Um, I'm not one of them. But when you look at the evidence that was used against her, you know, the, even if just something small, like the, a really difficult coincidence to swallow, like Travis being killed with a certain kind of rare caliber gun and that same kind of gun being stolen from, what was it, her grandparents' house and things like that. How do you address this idea that she was innocent or that she was somehow justified in killing Travis? Well, I mean, I really don't. It's not my task. Um, I don't know if I'm taking your question correctly, but it's no longer my task to do so, and oh, yeah. I never believed it to the first in the first place, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, in my books, I lay out uh, a, a theory, my theory that I had in 2013. In a more recent book, I lay out my more recent theory. But, you know, what is really amazing uh, that stands in defiance of all this disbelief is if you recall when she was finally sentenced in april of 2015 she had a chance to do what's called an allocution she gets to address the judge and the entire courtroom and if you recall during that allocution she said that mr alexander was alive and when she slit his throat Mm -hmm. Meaning she based, she in essence committed, confessed to first degree murder. Mm -hmm. She'd already been convicted of it, but there she was in open court confessing to first degree murder and people will still believe her. Yeah, yeah. Shocking. <laughs> well, no, not nowadays. <laughs> uh, all sorts of things going on out there. I mean, you know, the world's flat and we haven't been to the moon yet, so. You know. Yeah. Um, so what, what do you hope people get? Like when they, when they pick up this book and they read it, what, what is it you want them to come away with? You know, a better sense of the trial, a better sense of, you know, some of the things that were going on maybe behind the scenes or some other realities that they might not see on TV. You know, everybody saw everything on TV, but they didn't really get a true sense i don't think that paints the entire picture it's it's one dimension of the of the case so my hope is that those people that open the book uh you know hopefully amazon's still shipping those books or opening their kindles and they'll get a better sense of the full dimension of the case a fuller dimension of you know who i am what was going on and I think they'll get a pretty interesting detailed theory of what I believe happened uh, on that on that fateful day. And they get to read my letter to Jody Arias, <laughs> which is fun, which is I fun. Bet. I put and, and and for your for your uh, listeners, they can go on my YouTube channel. I made a little uh, I had a little cartoon made where I read a section of that letter to Miss Arias. It's a fun little two minute video. <laughs> there you go. Uh, now, so you've been on this um, 
uh, health health kind of kick and mental health sort of thing, and you did that tour and and book and stuff like that. Are, are you still doing that? Well, um, obviously, we're, we're, everything's been clamped down for the past couple months. Right. But yeah, I mean, my book "Defend Your Greatness" is still out there. Um, I still try to do what I can to teach and inspire people and. And, you know, my first show that I did, one man show, was called Infamy Cancer Life. And it dealt with, you know, dealing with some of the things that infamy and what I went through with cancer. But in overcoming Jody Arias, I'm telling a tale, I think, that I hope will inspire people with the things they need to overcome in their lives. You know, I think what, what I say is that, um, you know, we all have things to overcome. And I've overcome a couple of whoppers, and that's cancer and Jody Arias. And therefore, you might have an a, a opportunity to learn a little something from me and get some laughs along the way. So um, that show is kind of my outlet now for inspiration. I'm writing some legal fiction right now, and um, my second work of legal fiction. And, and who knows what might be next. There might be more. Uh, self improvement stuff, and certainly I've, I've been on a lot of shows and talking about that and and making happiness a priority, which I think you know is um, is a bit, is a big important thing because I think unhappiness is one of the biggest uh, plagues facing so many of us in our in our country. So, which which was worse, cancer or areas? <laughs> I was going to ask, but I didn't. Want to. <laughs> well, you know me. I'm... I know Al. It's your well. Job. <laughs> they're both pretty bad but here's what i say look i could have called the show overcoming cancer but um i have to call it overcoming jody arias because more people associate me with her than being a cancer survivor and i could i could cure the very cancer that plagued my body and people would still say Jody Arias' attorney cured cancer. It wouldn't be Kirk Nermy cures cancer. So um, in that regard, Jody Arias is the bigger foe because that is one that's going to stay with my life forever, that association, and that's the biggest thing I need to overcome moving forward. Pretty pretty, pretty amazing. Um, and... It's just kind of it's kind of unusual. So, do you have you had any reaction from her since the the new book, or is it just sort of all shut down? Well, yeah, the uh, prisons, to my understanding, or whomever. But uh, you know, maybe when that's over, um, I might I might hear that. And of course, you know. Um, in Arizona now, she has a chance to, you know, continue her petition to the Arizona Supreme Court, and she also has a chance to file post-conviction relief petitions that basically say that I was ineffective uh, in, in my counsel of her, which I'm looking forward to as well because then people get a better understanding of why I was telling her story and that it indeed um, was her story, so I'm I'm looking forward to that in in many instances. What a crazy situation! How how is your health then? How are you doing with that? Good. Um, in February, I had a checkup. I had my uh, annual scan, and um, I was clean, which was really good news because a couple of years ago I had um, a concern that I had a nodule on my lung that had developed since chemotherapy, but um, we're all good. Everything is benign, and I'm about, you know, next February, I, I'm hoping to be able to declare that I'm cancer-free, but right now, now I've certainly got aches and pains um, associated with, um, you know, chemotherapy and the joints and everything like that, but, um, you know, standing up, being above ground with those pains is much better than, than being in the ground. So um, overall, I'm I'm doing quite well. Were you a little worried about the uh, COVID nineteen and all that? Yeah, I mean, you know, having a compromised immune system, it makes me, um, you know, more concerned about my safety, certainly. But you know, at the same time, there's only so much it can do, and one of the things that that I teach is one of the things that I've had to live is just understand that fear of anything, you know, 
being scared of COVID isn't going to keep anybody from getting it, right? Mm -hmm. And if you get COVID, you're, you're not going to say, oh, my God, I'm glad I worried about getting it because now I'm more prepared to get it. No, you're not, right? Yeah. And so we, we have to live our lives, and fear is one of the greatest combatants of happiness. And we have to live our lives in a way where we don't let fear control us because then we can't really live the lives we're destined to lead. And I think that just leads to unhappiness. So I'm doing my thing. I'm following the orders. But, um, you know, I'm not sitting in the corner with a, a mask on and a, and a hazmat suit doing all that. I'm just living my life, doing the best I can. And, you know, fortunately, Alan, you're well aware of this. A writer's life is a hermit's life anyway. So yeah. one can one can function well in the, in the home. And I'm maybe uh, us writers are a little more uh, psychologically prepared for the, uh, the isolation than most. Yeah, actually, I, I haven't had a big change other than I usually uh, travel a little more to and from places when I'm researching or working but um you know people are overrated anyway so <laughs> <laughs> well I, I i wouldn't agree with that but yeah you know it it's certainly you know the the, the travel and everything it's uh, zoom zoom comes in handy doesn't it yeah yeah well you know i'm just a mean old cranky person so <laughs> don't anybody but don't anybody believe that don't anybody believe that yeah it's true Miserable. Um, At least not I, the mean part. Yeah. You know. <laughs> hey, you, you know, one thing I noticed uh, was just here, what's this in December when I'm going through it? You wrote, you put out a book called Sex Club Killer. Was that right? I did. Oh. That was my first work of legal fiction. I know it even has sex in the title, too. That's lazy. Oh. No, I yeah. put out a, uh, yeah, I decided to um, put my first work of legal fiction out there, you know. Um, I was, I'm always been kind of inspired by, um, the author Mickey Spillane. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with him, oh, yeah. but he wrote a lot of kind of hard boiled crime novels. One of the greats. And, uh, yeah, and of course, if you read them now with, uh, the, the, the 2020, uh, vision that we have in 2020, you see that, uh, boy, they're kind of sexist and things like that. But, oh, so I yeah. thought, you know what, what, well, it kind of is putting it mildly, right? But I, I decided to put a maybe a more uh, time appropriate spin on some of those and um, use that kind of inspiration, that hard boiled um, characters and, and life to um, bring it into the modern era. So, um, Sex Club Killer was my shot at that, and, I, and I'm working on another one now. Oh, is it? So, is it going to be a series of? Uh, the same sort of people involved in in the in in the books are all going to be different. No, right now, uh, you know, this one being my second one, this is going to be different. There's no um, overlap, if you will, yet. But um, certainly, thoughts of having a, an ongoing um, theme have, have been in my head. Well, we'll we'll see. I always tell we'll see what the uh, uh, what the story tells me it, it wants. So, uh, you know, we just let that, let the story feed itself, I guess, and see where I wind up. Are you, are you getting the ideas? Is it just comes from, from your imagination or is it kind of a combination? Is it stuff you've dealt with or cases or other legal people you've met or where does it come from? Well, it, it's mostly imagination. I think, you know, um, the dictates of the story and how it's going to flow are all just things that just kind of flow through me. But uh, having that basis in law, uh, I think, adds an element of realism to those books, right? You know, because I've been there, I know that. So if my character is, you know, going to trial or is an attorney or something like that, I feel like I have a good, I can draw on my experience in that regard, as opposed to I'm not, in any way, like retelling stories of cases gone by, if you will. They come from my imagination, but I can bring some realism to the situation because of my 15 years in the in the criminal justice system. Hmm. I'm just wondering, because that one you have a, a character, what, Dr. Lorna Horton. Um, is that based on someone you know, someone you want to tell us about? or? 
<laughs> no, no, it's not. No, it's not. Oh. It's 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 based on what came through my uh, imagination. Oh, that's too bad. I know you were hoping for some ju- juicy. Yeah. And what what answer were you hoping for, Al? Like oh, Taylor uh, Swift or somebody? Yeah, <laughs> Nancy, <laughs> Nancy, yeah, Nancy Grace. <laughs> I sh- I should have said Taylor Swift and cut cut Al's reaction to that. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, there you go. Oh, Al would have myself. ended the interview right there. Well, that's no. enough with Kirk Darming. Thank you guys. No, we want to get more. No, <laughs> we don't shy away from that stuff here. We we get into oh, all right. Yeah, we get into the dirt. Ah, oh, well, that's great. So um, so what's next? Just more of these um. Uh, these kind of crime books or um, uh, when things open up again, are you going to kind of go back on tour again and start talking about um, health and, and stuff like that? Or Well, I think immediately when it comes out, like right now, in, um, I was set in April to perform at a comedy club in Arizona called Stir Crazy, which was going to be my host for Overcoming Jody Arias, and we've backed that show up to August. And so I'm going to be um, kind of focused on that show, but I'm also going to do um, private, you know, speaking events. Uh, I've, I've done speak for uh, corporations, you know, their conventions, meetings, and that sort of thing. So when we get back to that, I hope to deliver inspiration to those people and hopefully uh, some laughs and uh, uh, some inspiration as well at the comedy clubs. Um, around the country with uh, overcoming Jody areas. When you do those comedy club, is that like um, a full-on comedy? Or are you are you making jokes and all that stuff? Like, what's that show about? Well, there's certainly some jokes. There's certainly some laughter, but it's it's not 90 minutes of of stand up. It's not you know Eddie Murphy, you know, up on stage type of thing, right? It's it's um, it's a story, but it's and so it's a one man show instead of a stand up routine. But it's a story. But there's there's moments of laughter. I talk about my life a little bit before the trial. Some of the humor behind the trial. There's some physical humor, if you will. And this, it's just a lot of fun to uh, get up there and tell my story. And I think, you know, stories, telling stories, as, as us writers know, is one of the oldest forms of communication. And I just um, add some laughter to it. So we're not serious. So we're having fun because I think laughter brings hope to people that are dealing with tough circumstances and things they need to overcome. So, um in between the comedy and in between the laughter, there's hopefully um, hope, room is made for hope. And uh, people have a good time, and they take something out of the show as well. I think one of made the biggest corollaries I would use is, you know, if you've ever seen Mike Tyson's one-man show, he tells the story of his life, and there's some laughs involved in the way too. So it's very interesting, inspiring at times, and, um, you know, you, you, get some, you get some laughs. Hmm. it's probably good for you too right in a way i think so it it allows me to um you know present myself in a different light to show a different side of me to show some of those different dimensions that we talked about earlier that that weren't shown uh during the trial but but more than that you know it's it's not a therapy session for me it's it's a therapy session for everyone it's it's fun therapy it's it's um like i say it's it it just gets into the root of the the reality that we all have so many things to overcome that and that we can overcome if we look at things in the right way so here's the here's the here's the big question so um um what do you think the most surprising thing about jody arias would be for people that they don't really kind of know about her. Wow. That's a question I've never been asked before. And I don't know what the answer to that would be, and I'm not even to, not not in an attempt to be <laughs> evasive because there's so much that people know about Miss Arius. But I think one of the things I guess that maybe people I think have forgotten. Um, in the mess of all this, and this doesn't deal just with Miss Arias, it deals with the whole thing, and 
and part of partially what we talked about earlier with the, the reality TV aspect. I think the tragedy of the whole event gets lost in when reality TV takes over and sporting events takes over, right? We have a sporting event or a reality TV, somebody wins, somebody loses. But, you know, as it relates to her or Mr. Alexander, no, nobody wins. There's no winners, there's no losers. There's just such a tragedy involved. I mean, I say, look, in Mr. Alexander, we have a beloved young man who lost his life. And in Miss Arias, we have a woman that was struggling, maybe dealing with some mental health issues that weren't yet defined, had no criminal history, and who threw her life away because there was no intervention. And so what, when, when, I ask, when I'm asked that question, I think about just the tragedy, not only to her, most prominently to Mr. Alexander, but to everyone involved, the friends, the family, there's just nothing but tragedy when we talk about the case. And, and I think that gets lost a lot. So I think rather than having some secret about things that people would know, it's, it's important as we talk about this case to just remind ourselves of the tragedy of it all. Well, I have a quick question here, Al, if you don't mind. No, um, no you know, speaking of losers, uh, last month it was probably lost in the news for most people, but last month Jody Arias's conviction was upheld by the Arizona Court of Appeals, and I, most of us weren't surprised by that, but obviously, as you mentioned, she's going to keep appealing this. Do you think there's any chance that any court will ever overturn her conviction? You know, it's it's hard to say, you know, what might motivate a court to overturn. And and this is this is one of those areas where I don't want to get speaking to is it too yeah. much. But, yeah. you know, if you read the, the, the court's uh, opinion, it was um, seemed like it was well-reasoned. It wasn't fly by night. But, um, you know, even as her former attorney, I don't want to speak against her. I'm certainly not obligated to speak for her. Mm -hmm. But... Um, I would find it, you know, uh, shocking if Miss Arias actually wound up in a courtroom again, apart from her uh, attempts to claim my ineffective assistance of counsel, which, like yeah. I said earlier, yeah. I'm looking forward to um, having that battle, and I hope, I hope the cameras are rolling. Yeah, the court pretty much said that the evidence against her was pretty solid, and there was no reason to consider it. So I hope that continues. You had you had co you had a co defense counsel. Um, have you ever spoke with her since the trial? Or well, I think I, I'd like to keep those you know relationships private, if you will. Okay, <laughs> not a problem. Um, wow. Um, I just and one other thing the um, with the gossip and and the the people that have conspiracy theories like. Um, Saying Alexander is still alive and protection, where where do you think that comes from? Like where, where yeah, it's laughable, but where, where do you think that um, comes from, and why does it catch on? You know, I really don't know. You know, like you you mentioned people that believe the Earth w is flat, right? Yeah. Um, I don't know where I don't know where that comes from, and and you know, I, the the number eludes me now as we're talking, but you know, there are thousands of people that believe the earth is flat right i forget what the number is there's you know i don't really know other than i do think there's a level of acceptance and camaraderie that comes with people that that share these beliefs and they can believe that they are special and unique and are the only ones that understand this i i guess that's somewhat of a need that's being fulfilled by that but you know, it's it's that it's you know it's that connection. I guess I don't know. What do you think, Al? Well, you know, with the flat Earth and things like that, you get you know. I think they have three hundred thousand membership. But I, I, okay, those people have a huge distrust for you know the government and and agencies and things like that. I just I just find that with the crime thing, um, it's it's sort of bizarre because. You know, he he was he was slaughtered by her, and um, we we pretty much know that. So you can have a distrust for government or the police or whatever. So I just I, I find that kind of to be very 
bizarre to think, well, he's still really alive. Well, isn't there a certain amount of well, cognitive dissonance that comes into that where it's like it starts off with the assumption that she's not the bad guy, that she's somehow innocent, and then more and more evidence starts to pile up that that's not true, and then they have very few outs, you know. They start yeah. to see there's only a few ways to keep this idea alive, and one of them is this ridiculous notion that he's still alive. I mean, there's pictures of her killing him, so I don't know how they get around that, but. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think I think you're right. Um, I because I was just going to say that I think there is a, you know, it's an admission that you're wrong, right? Like I think, like even when I come out and people understand more uh, about me and they don't see me in that intensely negative light, they don't want to believe it because they they don't want to believe that they were wrong in the first place. Right. right. And that's kind of what you're talking about. So they assume that. The, they don't want to believe they're wrong in the first place. They don't want to admit it, so they will contort reality. Like you know, you know, if they don't believe me, anything I've said in the book, they said, "Well, I'm changing. I'm selling out. I'm doing this. I'm doing that," because they don't want to believe that they're wrong. And sometimes, you know, whether it's ego or what it is, we have a hard time believing we're wrong when we make these impressions about people. Um, we've cast our lot, and we don't want to be considered to having made a mistake. Yeah, only I am never wrong. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so now, Kirk, do you have a website or a place that people can uh, find you? I do. Um, you can go to kirknermy.com or unchainlives.com. Kirknermy.com has a link up to... Uh, all my books, the Arius books, the um, personal development books, and the legal fiction book um, that we were talking about earlier, Sex Club Killer, they're all there, um, all available on Kindle, so those those folks that are um, barricaded within their houses can uh, easily get that and, and enjoy some of their uh, time in quarantine by by reading those books. Fantastic. Now, we're going to have that linked up as well, so people on our website or on our app can just do one click and and uh, and find you and find your books. So that's all set. Now, um, again, um, our guest has been Kirk Nermy, and um, we're talking about his new book, and it's the, his final words, and uh, it's uh, Trapped with Miss Arias. Um, thanks a lot for being here, Kirk. You bet, gentlemen. I, I enjoyed it greatly. Thank you. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back. 